Yeah. They should, but you know. Yeah, whenever you guys are, we're good. It's okay, we're gonna get started here. Okay. Here we go. Do your introductions. Okay. Step up to the mic, Tony, go. How's everybody doing? Y'all having fun? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Welcome to B Sides Las Vegas. No, Orlando. Orlando, yeah. No, Las Vegas. Orlando. Yeah. So we're going to talk about security management without the suck, because we all know that security management is an incredibly sexy and fun topic, right? Um, we kind of think we need to take a little bit more common sense approach to things. Uh, so that's pretty much what this talk is all about, all right? So first off, my name's Tony Turner. Um, you know, I'm dad, Star Wars nerd. Uh, I'd like to have fun. I, I geek out of a lot of security stuff, but you know. We all have other interests as well. I run uh, B-Sides Orlando along with uh, John Singer and Jeff Toth, right out here in the audience. Thanks for coming, guys. Um, also run the uh, OWASP Orlando uh, chapter, also with John Singer. Um, do a lot of web application security stuff. Um, and I've worked as a security manager in the past. I've built a couple of security management uh, programs for some incredibly dysfunctional organizations. You'll see as we go through the talk that Tim and I have slightly different pers perspectives on things, um, just because I've had the misfortune to work in some of the most horrific companies you ever could possibly work for. Um, I'm a managing security consultant for GuidePoint Security, um, and I have lots of certs that are completely irrelevant. Here, Tim. All right, I'm Tim. Over the years, I have been doing a bunch of stuff from standard IT to security. I'm now information security analyst at a uh, research university. I do information, I have to say South Florida, I come up in Goon, uh, besides Orlando, because those guys are awesome, and I do a lot of other stuff. I got a small family, my oldest is normally here at besides Las Vegas, but he's in his second week of basic. So he's not here anymore. So enough about me, but let's get moving. Think of Tony? Oh, it's still me. All right, so I guess it's still me. We've worked on this for like the past two months and got together yesterday to hash things out. So, scenario. So, we're going to assume a couple things here. One, you've been tasked, you've been given appropriate basic level authority to start your program. You've got some budget and some support from higher end. You may be the C level you may not be. So we're just giving some basic assumptions that you're actually validly approved from your company to start doing this. Because without it, it's an effort in futility because nothing is gonna happen. So the first question you have to ask is what is the goal of your program? Do you wanna be more secure? Do you have to be compliant to something? You know, what is your goal? You have to understand that. So. How do you do security policy? This is the classic way you do it. Google security policy, do a replace, publish that shit, and oh, crap, we failed. And now we look for a job. <laughs> right? So you cannot create security policy in a vacuum. You have to talk to stakeholders. You have to go out and you have to talk to people in your organization. So, so uh, security policy is just one component of your security program, right? I think there's a lot of other meta issues that come up when we start talking about building security programs. Um, the first that I, I, I see a lot of people struggle with is we don't know what to do, so let's go look at what other people have done. Oh, there's all kinds of great frameworks out there. ISO 27000 or COVID or whatever the heck your, you know, the, the framework flavor of the week is. And so you go out and you implement this framework without understanding what your actual needs are and whether that framework actually maps to the resources that you have available. I mean, some of these frameworks are massive. They're in incredibly cumbersome, and it might make sense if you're a Fortune 500, a little bit less sense if you've got a security team of one guy. 
or maybe a security team where you're only half an FTE security. I mean, we see this all the time. We have you know, resource issues all over the place, uh, not only from you know, the people that you have to apply to the program, but also the money resources uh, that, that you have to apply to it as well. Um, and management prior priorities may not lead to doing what you need to do to accomplish uh, comprehensive framework adoption. Um, I, 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 don't get me wrong, I think frameworks can provide a lot of value, but you really have to cherry pick, right? What, what, what works best for you? You may want to do it in a phased approach, um, but you're not going to, if you're a small, medium-sized company, you're probably not going to go out and just say, oh, we're going to do ISO 27,000 today and knock it out by this weekend. That's not going to happen, right? Um, we also have issues with stakeholder communication, and that's going to be a recurring theme as Tim and I talk, uh, talk about this. Um, there's a lot of information that we have to bring back from the business. Security, especially if you're in a security organization that's embedded inside of IT, sometimes you have a very insular look at the business. You don't really understand how the business really operates. You understand from an IT and a technical standpoint, but there's a lot of business processes that you maybe you're not plugged into. There may be applications out there that you don't even know about or what they do. Um, so we really need to get some visibility into this stuff. We need to know what's sensitive. Why is it sensitive? Why is it important? Where is it? Um, and the security controls that we start putting in place as a result of our security program, are they, are they integrated with the way people do work? Are they creating issues for people? Maybe you're hardening systems so securely that's really great from a security standpoint, but people can't do their jobs. It's kind of a problem, and you're going to severely damage the credibility of your program. Um, lack of management prioritization. I mean, this, this is a huge one. I think we've all seen this. Um, it, it may be uh, an issue where management really doesn't care about security, or maybe they do, um, but it's a, secondary, it's a secondary concern. And I think in most organizations, in most uh, sensible organizations, security is not going to be your number one priority. It's whatever the business function is, right? They're not in business to be, hey, everybody, we're the most secure organization on the planet. They're in business to make money or to provide a service whether you're talking about a government entity or you know private sector that's more profit oriented um, and we need to understand those things and find ways where security can enable those goals um, why should management care if you can't demonstrate how your security program is enabling those business functions then they're probably not going to care um, we have uh, issues with integration with operations I mean this 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 is pretty huge um, especially when you have security teams and operations teams that are not, they don't have the same reporting structure, or uh, maybe there are some other divisions or maybe political issues within the organization. And that's something else that's going to be a recurring trend. As we talk about relationships, there's a lot of politics involved with running a security program. I mean, for, for people that are largely technical people, a lot of times we have a difficult time kind of wading through those political issues. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that as we go through. Um, Big thing, big thing here is understanding that ops typically has one goal, and that's reduced downtime, right? We typically have one goal, and that's to make things secure and to keep our jobs, right? Um, those two things kind of to be the fall guy when something happens, <laughs> we get fired. The company goes, exactly. he wasn't doing his job." Exactly, exactly. Those are those two goals are kind of diametrically opposed at times. We're asking, sometimes asking ops to do things that directly impact those downtime metrics that they're relying upon for their own performance, uh, those performance metrics with management. Um, and, 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 and lastly, from a, from a meta issue standpoint, uh, kind of talk a little bit about kind of the organizational hierarchy. Where does security, where does the security department, the people that are responsible for security decisions uh, fit within the organization? Um, if you're too far down the stack, removed from the C level, you're never going to be able to implement any kind of strategic plan it's always going to be a completely tactical model where you're in reactive mode and you're just dealing with issues as they come up. It's going to be very, very difficult to be proactive about things when you're operating in a completely tactical model. Um, we, how, how, do we, how do we fix things? I, I can identify things all day long and send it over to ops, but is anything actually getting fixed? How, how, do, I, how do we work together? Uh, and that's a really important part about that. And again, that comes, that comes down to relationships. Some of that comes down to management structure and you know, who reports to who. But even if there's not direct uh, chain of command there that supports those kinds of things, there's still some things that we can do through relationship building to ensure that when we identify issues, and talking critical issues that are really important, not every 
you know, chicken little moment that you find when you run a vulnerability scan and you find 50,000 vulnerabilities, right? The really important stuff, if we can demonstrate that stuff for operations and get them on board and getting this stuff actually resolved. Um, and the other piece of this that, that uh, I just want to touch on a little bit is it, ch change management is kind of like one of these core things that, you know, uh, unmanaged change is kind of a bad thing, but are these processes that you're putting in place actually hindering you from responding to incidents as they occur in your environment? Right. We need, to, we need to have a little common sense here. I mean, if you're actively being attacked, I don't think you want to wait for the change review board to meet next week before you implement a firewall rule, right? All right, so the beta array is radio. Just what we need, another acronym. <laughs> oh, but at least it's not a TLA. All right, so the basics of radio. Security management must map to real business objectives. We need to truly understand the business, and we can't do this by sitting in our office, sitting in our mom's basement, or whatever. We need to understand the data, the products, the goals, the customers, et cetera, from the stakeholder's point of view. So radio is reconnaissance or relationships. You need to go out and look at your entire organization. Analyze. You need to go back and look at the information you got from your reconnaissance. Then you need to develop a plan then you need to implement it, and then you need to optimize it. You're not going to start day one when you implement your plan, and it's not going to be everything you need. You're going to start smaller than you want, and you're going to grow toward where you want to be. So step one, reconnaissance. Communicate with stakeholders. What you need to do is you need to grab an organizational chart of your company, look at the positions you need to talk to, Get names, either if you know them, you need to go talk to them. If you don't know them, you need to get introductions to them. If you don't have anyone to introduce you to them, you need to go introduce yourself and set up some time, half hour, 45 minutes to sit down with them and actively listen to what they're doing. Your introduction should be about two or three minutes. Hi, I'm Tim, I'm from security. Um, I'd like to set up some time with you guys in the next week or so to sit down and understand what's important to your business line, to your portion of the business, so I can sit, you know, so I can come back and make some recommendations and work with you to make things more secure without getting in your way. Inventory. You know, we need to know what's in the environment. We need to know all the hardware, all the software. That's pretty easy. But what about the data? What about the use of that data? Who uses what systems? That's the harder stuff. Step two, analyze. This is where we need to look at that information we've gathered by talking to people and correlate that with the information that we have gathered from our scans of the network and our understanding that way. How are you measuring success? Or how are you going to measure success? When you're going through and analyzing this, you need to be looking for things you say, you know, I think it'd be important to, to watch that to see as an indicator of whether we're doing things right or wrong. Right now, if you don't understand, you know, if, if you're starting out, you have no metrics, just throw everything on a piece of paper or a spreadsheet or whatever and capture it. Say, oh, I might want to wa watch that. Put it down and look at it later. You can always go through and say, you know, I've wrote down 50 things. I think these five things or these 10 things will be really good key indicators. Validate that with the community and then go ahead and measure those. Do you have the right people on your team? So, Again, as you're analyzing your data, put it in a form you understand. Do you want it on pen and paper? Do you want it on a whiteboard? Do you want it on an Excel spreadsheet? Do you want it in a database with you know everything in there? Know your limits when you're designing your security program. This is very key. If you are 15 levels down from the sea, from the sea levels, you're not going to be able to force anyone to do anything. This is where relationships are key. This is where when you've gone and talked to these people and met with them and understand them and you can come back and say, you know, 
I'd like to make some recommendations for you that will help. I don't think they're going to cause a major impact on your environment. If you're talking to the ops guys, you say, I'd like to make things more secure. And I understand we're, you know, 80% utilization on the servers for our AD. Um, and what I want to put in place is really going to take another 10 to 20% utilization. And we can't do that right now and keep your uptime there. So I'm going to push from my side to say, yeah, I, I concur with ops that we need to get better servers more up to date so we can finally push these things out to make us more secure so we can meet our goals. You know, if, are you the CSO of the company? And you can walk down and say, we are doing this tomorrow. Or, you know, do you have budget? Do you have hardware? You don't have that authority. You're going to be spending a lot of time, again, as we talked about communicating and developing these relationships, if you don't have that authority, if you don't have that authority to be able to uh, go directly to these people and make things happen, you, you may have to do a little negotiating. You may have to find ways to understand what are the what are the pain points for your ops guys or your other stakeholders? What what problems are they facing? They may not be security problems. They may be other problems that you can help them with as a security person. You make recommendations internally. If you hire external uh, consultants to come in, and you can, you know, find ways to you know get that recommendation in the report that says, hey, these ops guys need new servers or they need to upgrade their Active Directory environment. Um, you can find ways to do some favors for these ops guys, uh, and get some benefit for yourself as well. Uh, and one particular organization I worked in in the past, I was having a lot of time getting uh, any kind of support from operations. Um, and they, they were just being very resistive. It was a very combative environment. I think many of you have probably seen similar things. Um, and what I found was by reaching out to these ops guys and finding out where the problems were, I was able to, we were able to meet goals uh, together. For instance, they didn't have good monitoring uh, on their endpoints. Now, again, this is years ago, but before people started, you know, sending all their logs to a sim and doing good log analysis. Assuming, you know, you guys are doing log analysis. Um, <laughs> you got approval for that, right? <laughs> and you have budget. Okay, good, good. So what I wanted to do at that point in time was I wanted to roll out a group policy to do some hardening on all the end systems. And the you know, server team was very resistant. They, you know, they weren't. Uh, particularly happy with the testing that I had done because I'd done it in kind of a sandbox environment and there was too much too much variation in the actual live production environment for them to have some comfort levels with this. And so what I did was I worked with them to build some scripts to provide to deploy these scripts out on the end systems, provide some of the monitoring capabilities that they needed to support their own operational efforts. And so we were able to kind of combine kind of our own both of our problem areas into one solution to roll out. They got something they needed, I got something that I needed. And everything, and everything was a lot better. I, does that mean that they were my best buddies after that? No, we still had a relatively combative relationship. We still had to deal with some of those things. But it was something that improved over time as I continued to demonstrate how I could help them do their job. And I wasn't just a, a drain on their resources, right? If all you're doing is going to your operations teams and asking them to do stuff for you that takes them away from the job that they're trying to do, they're, they're not going to thank you. You have to be able to provide some value to them as well. So look at the conclusions you're drawing and make sure they kind of make sense. You know, step back from it a little bit. Try and look at it from their standpoint. You know, is what you're doing going to cost them time or money? And can they veto what you're trying to do? You know. Step three develop a plan. So we've gone out, we've done our reconnaissance, we've done our analysis, and now we need to sit down and develop a strategic plan. Without a strategic plan, you're going to be lost in the woods. Do we need a framework? Is our ultimate goal a framework in three years or five years? You know, do we have a mandate in, you know, three years we need to be ISO compliant or in, you know, a year we need to be HIPAA compliant? So on the ISO front, even if you develop a security plan that's not a true ISMS, it's still going to lead you to getting to an ISMS. And if you can make some early inroads and create a plan and roll it out and show you're not doing bad things 
and get some credibility, you know, and get some credibility and show things up front, it's going to help you further down the road. Remember, organizations are political structures. One person with the ear of the CEO, the CFO, or whatever can ruin your entire plan. Everyone remembers Leroy Jenkins' video, right? They were doing, they assembled this massive raid in World of Warcraft. They were going out, and this one guy, Leroy's like, I'm going to troll their asses, and goes out, hits the guy before everyone's ready, and just runs. Everyone else got slaughtered. You know, so one, but, one person can screw up your entire plan. Communication. It's not just important during recon, but after you develop your plan, you need to go back to the stakeholders. You need to emphasize the portions of your plan that are relevant to them. When they push back and say, I don't know if we can do that, it looks like it's going to be an awful lot of work for our people. Say, well, what are your concerns? How can we make this less impact to you? What do I need to give up on my side to help make this successful for your team? So, you know, you need to have buy-in for these people before you go and present this to everybody, else, you know, as a group. If, you want, if you've got five different business units and you've gone and you've talked to each one of them and you've shown them, when I'm working with you guys in ops, here are the things that we're going to make more secure. I believe it's going to help uptime by X, Y, and Z in reducing the amount of malware on the systems. When you're over here talking to sales, you know, we're, when we do this, your guys are going to be able to get in remotely and securely. So when they're at Starbucks, they're not going to get compromised and all your sales data is going to go to the client, or to, the cust to the competitors again. When you go over and talk to financial guys, this isn't going to cost too much money because we're doing X, Y, and Z to mitigate that. And you get buy-in before you go and present this to everybody. So you're going to walk into your meeting later on and say, hey, here's our, here's our presentation. We've covered everybody's you know, concerns as much as we can. And there are times, I, I hate to say this, but there are times when you need to make the stakeholders feel like their input is being valued. And you have to do Which what you have to do. Which is all the time. Right, well, no. You always want to make them feel like their input is being valued, but there are times when you're not actually going to be incorporating their feedback, right? I mean, you can't please everybody. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we still have a goal here of achieving a more secure environment. I mean, you can't cater to everyone's wishes that, I don't want to type in a password when I log in anymore. Can you make that happen for me? You know, I mean. I just want to wave in front of my webcam. Hi. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I, you know, we, we need to continue to keep them engaged and keep them involved. But all throughout this, we need to use some common sense. Mm -hmm. So get your commitment from the stakeholders. Know your commitment before you go to roll out the plan. You don't need 100%, but you need a majority. You know, if you can get four out of five of your stakeholders on board with this and you go to roll it out, that one person's probably going to keep their mouth shut and not really be like, oh, I don't really like this, but, you know, I think we can move forward on this rather than saying, no, we're not going to do it. If everyone's kind of wishy-washy, you're in trouble. Step four. Implement the plan. You got to push the button sometime. You should already have sufficient buy-in. You should already have sufficient port, um, support. You know, what level of authority do you have within the organization to push this out? You know, you need some help. If you've got an executive sponsorship, it's going to make life a little easier. If the CEO has gone and talked to everybody in the, you know, in the company via, you know, an email or whatever else and said, you know what, this happened at Target, this is not going to happen here. He's got the authority to put this plan in place and I need this done in six months and you will not get in the way or you will be fired. Is a lot better than having, you know, the CSO going, you know, we need to make things more secure and the CEO going, yeah, well, if you can make it happen within budget, go ahead. And if you're getting too much pushback during the implementation phase, it's because you didn't do the development phase properly. We I mean, don't have good relationships. Yeah, and, and, and that has to be key throughout this process. So 
when you do that implementation, whoever, whichever stakeholders it's going to impact, um, you need to be able to have those conversations during that development of that plan. So when it comes time to implementation, you can just push the button. Obviously, things don't always go right the first time. I mean, we, we need to have some back out plans. We need to have uh, some ways that we can deal with issues arise, okay? But most of the bulk of that work, honestly, should, be, should occur within the development phase. And you should, you know, in unless you're environments where you have to force things down everybody's throat, you should not be forcing things down people's throat. You should have the relationship, and people should say, "Yeah, I'll give that a try for three months. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't impact us horribly, we can keep it. Or if it does, and you come back and optimize this and fix it for me, we're good with that." And remember, when you implement, do it in steps. You know, roll it out to IT first. Roll it out to your group. Make sure it doesn't impact things to the degree it can. You know, um, are you pushing out new firewalls? Do you have to push it out to every single, you know, business branch in one weekend, or can you transition it? Can you make it smaller bites so that if you've got a failure or something major that you didn't think was coming up does, you can now stop, roll back without affecting everybody. You know, if you're if you've got you know, 500 things on your list that you need to implement, implement a couple at a time and just make it a phased rollout. Do it like um, change, not change management, but um, DevOps. Do little changes all the time and then people aren't going to notice it, especially if it doesn't get in their way. Step five is optimize. So once you've gone and you've rolled out your plan and it's a success, which it should be, what you want to do is Realize your security goal is over there, and you've done this. You've made one step towards your goal. Now the part of the part now part of the plan is you need to keep making incremental steps till you get to your goal of being quote secure. But that's a, a moving target. So you need to go back, look at where pain points are for your for your um, stakeholders. Look at other things that are pain points for the business or more security that you need to add. Okay, we've gone, we've, we've enforced passwords. We've got good password length. We've got good password rotation in terms of time. The users are happy with that. You know, we really should add two-factor authentication to the administrators so that, the, so that their box, they can't get popped as easily. Now maybe we need to add that over to financial services. We may not put that to sales guys yet because, well, they're sales guys and it doesn't really matter if they have two-factor off. But just start making more and more small changes in the environment slowly and with buy-in to optimize your plan. And make sure people know that your door is always open, you're always willing to learn, and to listen to them. You know, don't go pushing stuff out when the sales got to sales, when they've got to meet their end core, you know, their end End of, end of uh, quarter goals. You know, try and work with them and have the open communication so you know when their deadlines are. And if you can avoid it, don't do things when their deadlines are. What about best practices? You know, best practices work everywhere, right? One what? Size fits all. One size doesn't fit all. So, I look at best practices as recipes as guidelines to getting me to do something. You know, how many people have gone to somebody's house and they had spaghetti? That tastes exactly like your mom used to make it, right? So there are slight differences in the way that we cook food. You know, if you're cooking for vegetarians, you're not going to use meat. If you're cooking for people who are um, Gluten-free, you're not going to use gluten in your recipe. You're going to tweak things around a little bit. So best practices are the same way. It's a guideline to get you close to where, you know, this is kind of what we want. Let's see what we need to change to get it implemented. Ah, the textbook rollout. This always happens, right? You read something, you adopt it, you implement it, and then you win, right? Oh, another fail. So real implementation, you read everything, you narrow stuff down, you vote, you make a decision, you reread your top choices or whatever it is, you tweak it, you implement it, and then you optimize it. You know, nothing goes 
You know, how many people have installed Windows? That always works every single time on all the hardware, right? What about Linux? Same thing. Oh, it doesn't? Okay. So how do you optimize things? A couple different ways. One, you can track you, you have to track metrics to make sure the processes you put in place are getting you the results you need. And use consistent metrics. Yeah. Don't just change metrics. If you get some metrics to Azure, use them this year, and the next year you change, you can't go back and see how this year compared to last year. So if you need to change metrics, keep the old set around for a couple years or a couple months or however long you track it so you can go back and say, this is where we are now, this is where we were, and we look good that way, and the new metrics are showing we also look good. Talk to people. You have to talk to people. You have to continue having relationships with them. Look for how people are avoiding work in your system and find out why. You know, I work at a research university. Um, I've got a, a pretty good relationship with the client services guys, and I've told them, anything I implement, when you guys find a way around that, great. You've now got a pass for 30 days, 15 days, whatever. You can keep doing that once we lock it down. That gives them incentive to find problems in my system, and then they get a little added bonus of being able to do things if, it, you know, if they need to surf somewhere that they can't. They get a little added bonus there that way. So it's a win-win. You know, I'm not going to punish them for going around it because I need to know. Conclusion here, talk to people, actively listen. You do care about what they have to say because it will make your job easier. If they like you and you give them things that are not causing them problems, they don't care about security. It becomes another thing they do. If you're always getting in their way and always throwing up roadblocks, they're going to work around you and you're going to be looking for a job. And remember, every step toward security is a step toward where you need to go. This stuff is complex. It's a moving target. You know, and you have to have allies. You know, you don't want to punish people in sales because they're doing things, you know, outside of your system and breaking it. You want to know about it so you can fix the system so it works for them and works for you. Use some common sense. You're going through this process. It's don't just stick to the best practices, the best practice. I hate the term best practice. When we talk best practice, we're really talking minimally, minimally acceptable practice, right? I mean, you see these lists of best practices out there from various organizations, whether you're talking NIST or whoever, right? They work in many, in many circumstances. They may not work in your environment. It may not make sense to have a password history of 30 passwords long in your environment. Right? I mean, you know, you see the one that CIS, uh, you know, guidelines for like the, with the, 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 the high level uh, security, for like 30 remember passwords. That's crazy. That's very difficult to be effective with, within your environment. Not all of us work in those kinds of environments. Maybe it doesn't make sense to adopt those top level controls. Maybe it makes sense to ratchet things down a bit. Use your common sense. One of the things we're looking at in our environment around passwords is we're looking at lengthening our password requirement. I'm looking at making passwords never expire. There are a few reasons you'll have to change a password. One, anyone finds your, your password, it gets changed. Two, if you reuse your password, and that, and, you know, say you use it on Facebook and Facebook gets popped, I download password list, run it against my systems. If I find your password, you have to change it. If your system gets popped, you have to change your password. If my infrastructure gets popped, you have to change your password. Without those happening, you know, there's, you know, if you can't get the SAM or the other password repositories off the system, there's no real reason to change passwords in our environment. 
So, you know, look at things and see what makes sense in your environment. We've got some legacy researchers who have the same password, less than eight characters, probably a dictionary word for the past 10 plus years. Because they're the customer to where I work, they're allowed to have that. So I need to come up with rules around that to protect it. Or convince them that they need to change and show them why. Any questions? Comments, concern, crude jokes? Yes? I don't know. I mean, as part of my as part of my job, I didn't really get much guideline. You know, I was brought in as the security guy. You know, make things more secure. <laughs> it's research education. So we do have some higher eds. We've got postdocs. We've got you know researchers coming in working on drugs and medical devices and stuff like that. So. You know, I'm like, you know what? I need to go out and talk to these people because I have no idea what they do. I've got a pretty good idea. You know, I can lock things down and make it, make it good, but if I really understand what they're doing and how they work, then I can really do this. So I'm going out and meeting with people a half hour, you know, an hour here and there. Nobody says anything. My boss is like, oh, you've been going out and meeting with people and talking to them? Cool. Um, can you give me the results? I'm like, yeah. You know, and I've made it my policy too because IT as a whole doesn't go out and talk to people. If anybody that I meet with has any gripes or any concerns with IT, I write that down and I go back and I talk to the stakeholders in my, in my organization. It's not my, you know, I'm not dumb. I'm like, I don't handle backups. We have a backup guy, but I will take this. I will bring it back to my boss and we will discuss this and we'll get an answer for you. One of the best sources of information within your organization is if you have mature business continuity programs within your environment, they're more plugged into how the business works and how the business processes works and what's critical and what the dependencies are than pretty much anybody else you'll talk to in your organization. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very valuable uh, resource to reach out to. If you don't have those kinds of programs in place, you might want to think about it. Well, well, that's where, depending on how long you've got to implement this, I mean, if you've got a very large, like, very large, like Fortune 500 or large, small company, you go and you talk to the key stakeholders, the C-levels, or those right below that. And you talk to them, you get their buy-in. They may say, go talk to these guys over here. But that helps you get an understanding of this. And, you know, if you talk to the C-levels, you say, okay, here's three things I can take away. Here's three things we can introduce that aren't going to cause a big problem. And then you can go meet with the next level of guys down and say, okay, what are your pain points? What are your concerns? And you can work on that and then move further and further down. Um, in my place, we've got a couple different sets of customers. We've got corporate, which is all the people that work for my university, they're corporate. If I need to get security policy in place, I can go to our CSO or acting CSO and say, I'm not sure what title, but I can say, here's what we need to implement. He can come out and he can say, this is a mandate. You will do this. These are corporate systems. You don't own them. I do. You're doing this. We've got probably 50% plus BYOD. Because the researchers 
don't like to spend grant money buying machines for people doing research. Hmm, go figure. It, it, so it's not always that simple, though, Tim. Right. I and mean, a lot of organizations, especially if you work for like a large corporate entity, has done lots of mergers and acquisitions, and you've got all these various different business units, and maybe they haven't all been integrated into the internal operational structure. Yep. They may not have common management structures. Yep. They may be in the middle of an integration process, uh, and. You kind of you do have to kind of start with the overall org chart and yeah. work your way down from there. But then once you get out to these kind of splinter groups, yeah, you have there, to look at no you have to treat things answer. differently. You, you you have to do the research. Once you identify one of these entities, are like, why why are they not plugged into the org chart? Why did I not know about this business unit? And then you've got to go. You need to find out and radio in, in, all in over any, again. In, in any in any instance, in most organizations that I've worked in, if there was kind of one of these splinter business units, there's always some kind of liaison, right? There's always some kind of interface with the core business, even if it's at, just at the financial level, right? There's some place where you can go and get information about who's actually running things over there. And then you, you might have to reach out to some people that are not plugged in to IT or security or anything to get at those people and at those systems and at those processes. It, it, it can be quite a quite a labyrinth to navigate, uh, to navigate. But you start with the core. You start with what's important. You start with, you know, where where is the really critical stuff? Where is the sensitive data? Right. Going back, you know, first step in radio reconnaissance. We have to we have to know where our stuff is, right? If we don't know where that stuff is, we're, we're pretty much lost. Yep. You know, and, and treat things separately. Like I said, I've got corporate. I've got I, you know, for the BYOD, I'm partial ISP. For the researchers, they're my, I'm their, they're my client. You know, they're the guys bringing the money into the institute so we can continue to work and they can do their research. So I need to support them. I need to stay out of their way. So one of the things I'm doing with those researchers is I'm finding out. I'm asking them questions in my interview. Um, do you guys allow remote work in your, in your group? Okay. How do you guys do that? Do you use Dropbox? Do you use Evernote? Okay, cool. Do you want your guys working on this stuff from home? No? Yes? I don't care. Whatever they want, I'm going to try to enable it and try and be able to set up monitoring so I can know that. If Tony's guys aren't allowed to work from home and I know all of his systems, which I don't yet, then if I see Dropbox or any remote stuff coming from his environment, I need to take care of that. If Gary's guys are allowed to work from home or from wherever in the world, then when I see Dropbox or whatever he's approved for his guys to use, I'm going to go, okay, Gary's guys are using that. All right, great. And I'm going to ignore it and move along. That's about the intelligence you gather that way. So any other questions? Yes. Well, that, that's where relationships come in, you know. My first month at, at this place, I spent a lot of time with the client services guys. I came out of, you know, break fix environments and small business environments and home environments. So I know virus removal. I've dealt with it far too many times. So I spent my first month, you know, over there helping those guys out. Anything they needed. Oh, you want help scripting? Fine, I'll help you write a script for that. Oh, you want help? Oh, you need other tools to pull this virus off? Well, here's some other ones I've found that are useful. Oh, you guys are doing that? Well, here's a tool to help you with this. Every single day, I was giving them another tip. Anytime they had a question, I answered if I could. If I didn't, I did some research or reached out to somebody I knew who did. So I built a relationship there. Now, if they've got a problem, they come to me. If I've got a problem, I go to them. And it works out very well because one of the ladies in client services has been there for eight years. My campus has been open for 10. She knows everybody. So she walks me around and, and introduces me to everybody. Oh, here's a new guy on our staff. He's a security guy. He, you know, and I get the intro that way. So now I'm not, a, I'm not doing this. So use your relationships. 
<laughs> it's not. It's not exploiting. That's trust transfer. Trust transfer. But you have to realize, though, just because they trust her doesn't mean they implicitly trust you. You have to earn the full trust, but at least you've gotten in the door without being the salesman. Anything else? Yes, you have to go. But but listen to this. You get to go sit in people's offices for a half hour, 45 minutes, and bullshit, and get paid for it. <laughs> Besides Orlando T-shirt. You guys want to talk more? We'll be in the back or out there.